Chris, thanks so much for making space for this interview okay. and for sharing a bit of your work and life with us uh, today. And uh, when I read about the, your, your professional life, I was astonished because, first of all, I thought, how can one person <laughs> achieve that much? And also, the, the, the results you got with uh, ADD were really amazing. So, you took a company that had a revenue of, what, 150 million to uh, more than 2 billion euros. Mm-hmm. You went from low starting point in the company and to become the president of the largest company in the world in the railway system, um, making locomotives and services and lots of things. So, tell us a bit about uh, how you managed to do it. Well, I wondered myself really when I looked back. But uh, no, I was a sandwich call student um, originally. It was sponsored by British Rail Engineering. And uh, uh-huh. and that was a great start. It was a fantastic training and <clears throat> experience on the shop floor and understood how people worked and how good, actually, a lot of the shop floor staff were. And uh, then I was appointed as a supervisor to start with. And... I think that was one of the most telling things because I thought, well, why am I a supervisor? These guys know more about it than I do and I'm supposed to be supervising them. And that was a, a bit of a, a challenge and I thought, well, maybe I can help them get a better way of working or asking them what, what really upsets them about the way things are. And, and we had a chat and then we, I said, well, why don't you come up with some plans? I'll see if I can put them in. And that was involving conveyor belts they wanted because there's a lot of heavy lifting and uh, and then uh, some cranes, simple things. And we got them in- implemented and uh, then I was taken away and uh, went to uh, London as a PA to the a board director. But so my life seemed to sort of continue from those shop floor experiences mm-hmm. into um, you know bigger fields, if you like. But I was always trying to improve. But... Um, as I got uh, on and uh, realized that really um, I am not the font of all knowledge. The font mm-hmm. of all knowledge actually is in the workforce. Mm-hmm. And I think that was really hit home to me that you're not expected to be the innovator in chief and the brains of mm-hmm. everything, well, but your, your, your workforce, mm-hmm. really, they are the ones. Mm-hmm. And you don't have to reinvent the wheel. You can look at what other companies do and you can look at talk to people mm-hmm. and you suddenly solutions are put forward the key is picking out the good solutions mm. and acting on them quickly i would say so it means that uh, you allowed or you uh, distributed power to people there on the shopping floor to make decisions about uh, improvements innovations well that became particularly critical i think when we got to a stage of privatizing the workshops division. We had eight uh, factories at that time, and uh, we had to. Um, we were privatizing four of them. They mm-hmm. were the main new build construction works and the main refurbishment repair centres mm-hmm. at Crew and Derby and York. Two factories in Derby. Mm-hmm. So that was the restructuring of the company and the recognition that we had to be very competitive to survive in a privatized world. Mm-hmm. So that was, um, and then we had a, a, a new managing director from the private sector came in. And he asked me to restructure the company as a decentralized organization mm-hmm. and headed up a working party, uh, which I did. And then he put me in as works manager at one of the works, Darby Loco. And we introduced the business unit philosophy with power and authority and uh, accountability pushed down to this business unit rather than at works manager level and uh-huh. functional here and there and uh, but uh, it could go wrong <laughs> were you not you like anxious about the possible mess that it could become or not not really no, no. I, I believed that uh, i could see i had seen through my experience the futility of some of the functional organization uh, structures where it was easy to pass the buck. It was mm. easy to pass responsibility. Nobody was ever accountable. You had mm. to have endless meetings to coordinate all these functional mm. departments. Mm. So at the end of the day, these were all wiped out and we had a very 
focus structure to deal with a particular product or mm. a repair unit or whatever it might be. Mm. And that enabled decision making to be at that level, no mm. excuses, that guy in charge was responsible. That's amazing. That's, that's the first, and that brought about dramatic changes because mm. that person had to deliver but we also had to support him because he might not have had all the skills and so mm. we had training and development and assistance with mm -hmm. his team. How many people you had uh, working for you at that time? Well at that time in Derby Loco it was about two, two and a half thousand Whoa. people so the other factories crew had about four thousand Derby Carriage was four thousand so Eight, you know, and York was about two thousand. So we had about twelve thousand in the four key factories mm -hmm. in total. So but plus headquarters, which was about six hundred and fifty, I think, at the time. Well, wow. my the plan was to bring that down to less than sixty uh -huh. and push things out. So I'm sure if you empower uh, the shop floor to make decisions as you did, you need a structure to make sure that uh, everyone is move in the same direction. The, the strategy of the company is uh, dictating the direction of the company. So how did it happen? How did you manage it like aligned? I think um, it was to get the message to everybody that we could only work together if we were going to succeed and we had to have trust in each other. Uh, and so that was I think the most powerful recognition firstly to recognize that I'm not going to do the change mm -hmm. everybody's got to do it mm -hmm. so um, to do that then we had to communicate and to we communicated firstly with our customer because I think that what we had to realize in the nationalized company it tended to be internally focused process focused the customer mm -hmm. He was there, but he was expected to give us work, which is mm. disastrous mm. Men mentally for everybody. Uh -huh. So when we had to move into a different um, sector private, to privatize, it was important to know what did the customer really think of us. So that was the number one mm -hmm. task. Mm -hmm. And we fed that information back to everybody on the shop floor, Fantastic. in the offices. Everybody knew good and mostly bad, of what the customer really thought of it. It was a shock to, mm -hmm. to many, because well, they never asked the customer that sort of yeah. thing. But we did say to the customer, we're looking to put that right. And we can only put it right if we ask you what you want mm -hmm. and what you're unhappy about. Mm -hmm. That went to everybody in the workforce. So we decided to set up communication groups. So having introduced structural change with decentralization, business unit managers over about 50 million turnover, and then um, product managers with about 10 million turnover each. Mm. So from me to the business manager, the product manager, the foreman, and the shop floor, it was about five layers. Mm -hmm. Previously, it was about seven, I think, or whatever. Uh -huh. But um, so the, or it might have been even eight. So. So we, we conducted that. So it was every Monday morning, I would talk to my immediate reports. They would immediate for 20 minutes. They would mm -hmm. go to their immediate reports and everybody would go down. And by that day, it may stretch into possibly the afternoon. Everybody knew what my message was to what the workforce. What start with was what the customer thought. Mm -hmm. And the product managers, talk to their direct customers and they got another more detailed feed of the reality and what was wanted. Mm -hmm. And so everybody knew we've got to do something about this and, um, and we can do something about it. Mm -hmm. I didn't know everything what needed to be done. I couldn't possibly. But those guys on the shop floor knew and we then established working groups. Uh, Im improvement groups, if you like, at mm. every level of the company. Mm. And they were volunteers, they weren't forced. And uh, they came up with uh, good ideas and the, the key message from me was, you action them immediately. There's no delay and excuses and it's got to get authority. You're the manager, 
Yeah. If there's got to be a certain amount of large amount of money, then that's a different thing. But so many things can be improved mm. just by getting on and actioning obvious flaws. Mm. And so that was the start. Fantastic. And, uh, well, how did you... Of course, if you are giving this level of freedom for them, because you, even the budget, you allow them to set the, the budget as well, didn't you? That was... That was a very well. That was a late. Very yes. <laughs> the first off, I thought budgets had to be done top down, and you had to drive improvements and force uh -huh. people and push and push. But after the first year of this process, um, suddenly these uh, business managers and product managers were setting their own budgets. I asked them to do that. Uh -huh. And they were coming up with targets and, and uh, improvements way beyond what I thought could be done. Wow. And that was the most uh, real shocking, not shocking, but the <laughs> pleasing <laughs> thing. Because uh -huh. suddenly I was there thinking, oh, I've got to put this to the board. And uh, is it going to be uh, too ambitious? In uh -huh. fact, I did put it to the board, but the board said, look, we can't put this to their shareholders. It's uh, too ambitious. We better pair it back a bit to what we're saying to the shareholders. But we achieved it. Fantastic. I mean, the, what the shop floor said they were going to achieve, they achieved. Now, that fantastic. is, yeah, it is fantastic. Well, uh, because uh, from so my, it's, <laughs> it's not me, it's them. <laughs> but from, from our perception, like a common perception is, if you let people set their goals like that, they will set like lower goals with lower yeah. budgets to make it easier, to make their lives easier. So no, they, they were more ambitious than the company or the general manager or the board of directors of the company. Well, maybe, maybe it was because we said to them, look, this is, we're not a great company in terms, we're great in skills and abilities, but we weren't performing very good, listen to the customer. Mm -hmm. So we got to change. Mm -hmm. So they, uh, if we want to keep the jobs, Mm -hmm. So they actually were very happy to initiate the change and achieve uh, shop satisfaction, pride and customer satisfaction because we got the customers to come in, having given them our initial plans to deal with their complaints, we had them come in and talk to the guys on the shop floor, the particular customers in the fields that was appropriate and thank them for the efforts that we they had put in wow. and that was quite powerful mm. and obviously some sections might not have been as good as others mm -hmm. and but they observed what was going on and this group that were the stars suddenly they thought well, why, why can't we be the stars <laughs> and so it seemed to be sort of accelerated self-acceleration almost from within a competitiveness also it was works conditions. I mean, on the shop floor, before it was reasonably tidy, but a bit dirty and what have you. So one of the key things was working conditions. I mean, we as a company should help and support um, the staff have better conditions. Mm -hmm. So they drove that and they made it. And some product units were quicker than others. Mm -hmm. And they, they wanted to paint the shop floors and make them look better and uh, pathways and what have you, which we agreed. They did it themselves. We didn't have painters coming in. We gave them an hour on a Friday afternoon to do their particular section. Everybody did their particular section. And then other parts of the factory looked and said, well, why have they got better, um, nice, nice working conditions and clean? Why can't we? So you can do it. Uh -huh. And so it, it just it seemed to accelerate right, and uh, it, it changed the, my role really because from building up to that, I mm -hmm. was always trying to drive this type of thinking. But now I was very much more strategic, which possibly enabled me to take on some other jobs within the new ABB and, uh, and Adtrans organizations, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. in addition to the job of running the UK mm -hmm. customer support oper operation. Fantastic. And uh, I read about uh, some, a uh, couple of principles that you learned from your dad, foundations from your dad. So how did it influence the, your style of work or, or, or this belief that you had that people would do it? Yes, I mean, I, my dad was, had a good moral code and uh, he said oh, 
always treat others as you would like to be treated. And mm. he was a guy from the shop floor. Mm. And, and he said, you got to realize, he said, you know, some managers and look down on the guys on the shop floor, but those guys are just ordinary people. Mm. And I recognize that. I played cricket with the uh, guys from the shop floor, actually, wow. in my, whilst I was still at school. Mm. And, um, and it really helps, it hits home that, yes, they have a pride. Mm. They like to do a good job. And it's wrong to think the only way that they're going to do a good job is by managers driving them or whatever. Mm -hmm. And I think it was the, um, you know, the lack of trust mm -hmm. results in bonus schemes mm -hmm. and time study and you've got to this, that and the other, which cause enormous conflict within the company. Mm -hmm. And uh, I had to actually work on a working party to sort all that lot out at one stage. Mm -hmm. but. I mean, putting trust and recognizing that people are proud of what they do, mm -hmm. and if you can encourage them to do more, mm -hmm. then they'll be even more proud. And that is a real fundamental, I, I believe. Mm -hmm. I think there was one or two others that I, um, I can uh, think. Oh, I'm trying to think. It was the certainly it was the. Um, I have it down here somewhere. And the other one, oh yes, um, sorry, and so the, the other one was treat others as you would like to be treated yourself. Mm -hmm. um, was that what I said in the... Um, no, you, you said it. Already. The first yeah. one, yes. Uh -huh. And, uh, I, I do. oh yes, and another one was, um, which... I think I'll cut, just come on. And the other um, lesson was you're, you're you're actually much better than you think you are. Mm. And I think that was something at school because um, they always encouraged me to ask if I didn't know. And I would people feel embarrassed to ask because they think everybody else knows. But in fact, mm. everybody else doesn't know, and you're mm. no different to everybody else. Mm -hmm. And um, and that message of you. And I felt that all the way through my career, that everybody up there was always better because they're all the way up there. But as I got progressively up, I found that they weren't actually <laughs> better than me. But, um, but they were very good at the job. I don't mean that disparagingly. But, mm -hmm. um, and I think the same applies, not just to me, but to everybody in the factory. They're better than either they think they are or, even, or the management thinks they are. Mm. And if you give them the freedom, then they will show you that they are because they know more the, about the real fundamentals of your business where there's bad quality why there's bad quality what mm -hmm. is needed to put it right and mm -hmm. those were key elements of some of the working groups mm -hmm. and it didn't cost a lot of money to put it right mm -hmm. and it was those guys that really the, the releasing of their energy in the company which was mm -hmm. so great mm -hmm. fantastic it's something remarkable though that I, I find is that uh, you were a uh, uh, govern government-run company, yes. uh, British Railway, or part of British Railway, and then you became a private company. That's a huge challenge because there is a, a whole mindset of uh, government-run company that is really not very dynamic, usually, mm -hmm. in most cases. And uh, so how did you transform uh, this mindset of... Uh, government company into a private company that was agile, fast, and uh, delegating a lot of authority and with uh, re the results that you got? I think one of the things is trust. Mm -hmm. And I think um, you can't do it by yourself. Mm -hmm. And it's a matter of trusting the workforce and them trusting the management, which mm -hmm. If you think of our company, it was bedeviled by strikes mm -hmm. in the um, 70s and 80s. Mm -hmm. And there was mistrust between management and the men. And it was a dreadful situation, really. Mm -hmm. And um, 
and I'm not saying whose fault it was. It was mm -hmm. you know, six of one, half a dozen of the other, no doubt. Mm -hmm. um, but we had to try to encourage trust. And at the same time, we had to reduce our workload by 50%. Mm -hmm. Because when British Rail privatised us, they took away uh, about half of our work to put it into other BR workshops, mm -hmm. depots. And that was a major challenge. Not only did we have to improve productivity and uh, competitiveness and so on, but we also had to um, deal with redundancies and mm -hmm. keep morale. Mm -hmm. So that was a major effort um, that we put in because we had to face up to the reality mm -hmm. and we told the unions and the whole workforce. But what we did do was set up employment offices within our factories, we contacted every single employer in the area and said that the quality of the staff were excellent mm -hmm. and we knew that there was some demand for these people but even if it wasn't in their own field, I mean many of them were very innovative and, uh, and good, good craftsmen, tradesmen and people mm -hmm. and we actually had a fantastic uh, achievement in redeploying these wow. staff into wow. local industry. It was very, very limited numbers that ever didn't mm -hmm. find a job, as well as, of course, we had some that wanted to retire voluntarily, mm -hmm. and we allowed that to happen. Mm -hmm. So that was quite, I think, a success, which helped maybe give confidence for the, from the workforce to oh, yeah. us as management. Yeah, they, they, for sure they felt like I cared for and uh, mm -hmm. they thought, well, these guys are not about just about like uh, doing their job and uh, making their money. They really care mm -hmm. for, for the workforce. Yeah. So that boosts the morale as well, didn't it? That's right. And uh -huh. also, I think when we privatized, we gave some shares to all the employees oh, fantastic. that was going to be with us at the, um, mm -hmm. in the new company. Wow. So um, they own the company as well. They have some shares, Fantastic. didn't have to pay for them, but uh -huh. they had the ability every year to encash those shares at a value that was assessed by external people, mm -hmm. auditors and so on. Fantastic. Chris, can you give us a, like a, a glimpse on, I have the list here, but I would like to hear from you, the, the results you, you got in the end uh, from implementing these, uh, all these uh, innovations that you did there. I read the list and, and, and I was so impressed. So perhaps if I if I read it, <laughs> yes. Uh, uh, but uh, I was checking here. Um, well, the, the, we needed rapid success mm -hmm. in changing the company because all the work was going out to competitive tender. A third in the first year, a third in the, two thirds by the second year, and everything by the third year, mm -hmm. and so. The customer complaints, which was the first thing we focused on, were eliminated within the first year. Wow. And I can remember being involved in crisis management meet, crisis meetings with the customer once every month. Mm -hmm. It was a standard thing. Complaints or vehicles were waiting because of um, shortage of materials uh, and um, you name it. Mm -hmm. um, uh, breakdowns and what have you. So those complaints ended up um, being eliminated in the first year and the customer said well I don't really want to have any more of these meetings we're wasting our time we're coming down it's, thank you for the lunch and but <laughs> you know it's um, <laughs> we, we've got other things to be dealing with so I said well before you go can I we just have a final trip around the factories and if you could just talk to the guys what you feel about what they have achieved, mm. which they did, and that was very good. So, so that was the first uh, com customer complaint. So the customer told the guys in the factory yes. what they felt. Yes. Amazing. Yes. And that was uh, really, uh, and they noticed, of course, the customer by coming around the factory again, that whilst it would look dirty and what have you, in the before, mm -hmm. they saw the factories being absolutely spotless. In fact, I used to smoke in those days, and I would go around the factories regularly, and and I would be smoking, and then I noticed once 
all these people were looking at me and I and I had the ash and I and I looked at them and I put it in my hand <laughs> and they laughed <laughs> and, watching you <laughs> yeah yeah that's right but anyway that was the, the customer complaints but then uh -huh. stop sh shortages we had a centralised computer system which um, was geared to actually have 92% first pick availability that meant 8% nil stops at any one time mm -hmm. now that might and they we were told by the functional heads and uh, BR that this was the most efficient way of running a company. Well, we did away with that centralized and it, we moved it down to the businesses and product units and they managed the customer supply, a uh, supplier chain. And um, again, I think uh, we, within the year, I think we we virtually had nil stocks. It was very abnormal if there was a nil stock item. Mm -hmm. And in the previous system, we had stock turns of four. Mm. By the end of the year, we had stock turns of 12. So we were turning our stocks every month. And because, and this is in a repair business, not in a new build, because the shop floor had technical staff who particularly looked at failure patterns. And we negotiated contracts with our suppliers on a 12 month basis with call offs. And also advise them that they, obviously in the repair business, you can suddenly have a spate of failures. And we needed flexibility from them to respond mm -hmm. to failures. But mm -hmm. what we would do is advise them immediately when we saw a pattern, something happening. Mm -hmm. We'd analyze it at shop floor level. And um, one, try to get the supplier to find out why his product, if that was the fault, is causing this and secondly provide spares to counteract mm -hmm. so that forward planning basically as against the historic computer system resulted in the stock um, uh, management system improving dramatically and having nil stock items mm -hmm. and also no vehicles in service waiting materials which Fantastic. was the one problem there Fantastic. And the suppliers we involved in that process of change, um, mm -hmm. which was quite, and we got cost reductions, purchase price reductions as a consequence by forward planning a lot more and making their life a lot easier. Mm -hmm. So we then looked at the shop processes because what we wanted was like just in time supply of materials at the shop floor. Mm -hmm and uh, the consequence of that and flexible working between trades so that one trade isn't waiting for another and to make things more self-contained instead of sending components off for repair in another area that's possibly a bit remote we try to focus processes within the um, repair mm -hmm. prime activity and that cut cycle times by half mm -hmm. And um, and space by half mm -hmm. as a consequence. Mm -hmm. um, so and then we, as I say, the flexible working and mm -hmm. uh, quality complaints uh, were virtually eliminated. And rectification work is the other thing that's as a consequence. If you get it right first time, mm -hmm. which was another message, uh, then you don't have to keep redoing your work. Mm -hmm. So as yeah. So as a, a consequence of these things, of course, the cash flow mm -hmm. was became good and um, because we were reducing inventories and so on. And the profits improved because of the reduced, um, improved efficiency and so on. And so, so after the first year, very successful. And so when we were coming to then uh, tender for a lot of work and also at this time we were also looking to expand and we started moving into Ministry of Defence work and uh, and um, other railways mm -hmm. so and in fact we had an extremely successful tender process uh, mm -hmm. as a consequence of our customers recognising that we, they were now getting an excellent service mm -hmm. so that was uh, an ongoing then after that we had an ongoing continuous improvement uh, mentality at the shop floor on all levels mm -hmm. so that if people recognise there was some more some more improvements could be done 
then that was initiated through these working groups, mm -hmm. voluntary working groups. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and that was recognised then, I suppose, uh, our performance. Um, and later, ABB took control of the company. This was about three years into this process. And um, a ABB is a private company that took over, and they are well, still on, aren't they? ABB were shareholders, 30% shareholders, okay. when we privatized uh -huh. with Trafalgar House and the employees. Uh -huh. Then, um, after three years, ABB took 100% control. Mm -hmm. And at that time, then I, they changed the structure of the company. Mm -hmm. And, um, and they asked, uh, myself to become business area manager for, um, customer support, support, mm -hmm. uh, worldwide, as well as continuing with my job in, um, in the UK. Mm -hmm. And um, so that became a new sort of type of experience. Mm -hmm. And um, and I'm trying to think then after another two or three years, then we became, we did a merger with Daimler Chrysler Rail Division. Mm -hmm. And so that merged company became Adtrans. And Adtrans uh, had a head office in Berlin and I, was appointed as executive director of that company mm -hmm. and I was responsible for executive control of the UK and all developing countries in the world mm -hmm. plus I was also responsible for customer support and signaling mm -hmm. so that was my portfolio mm -hmm. um, and then after and there was quite dy dynamic growth we um, did acquisitions in the East some East European countries and uh, and we gained contracts around the world so we had mm -hmm. activities in North America Latin America Africa Far East Australia mm -hmm. and um, so and it, you became the number one the number one yes. in the world for railway uh, services yes and, 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 also, services. and also for the um, new build we were uh -huh. the number one private company in the railway supply business, Whoa. total supply, Whoa. and in customer support. Uh -huh. I mean, my, one of the things that I was driving was convincing other countries, governments and railways, that there's a lot of advantage in privatizing their repair operations. Mm -hmm. And a, vague, a lot of these people, a lot of these people came to uh, the UK to visit our factory mm -hmm. and um, and I asked them to compare it with what they have and mm -hmm. you know and if we th they thought that we could help them then we would do so which mm -hmm. um, we did we bought acquired some of their facilities and mm -hmm. uh, and also started securing private sector maintenance contracts with the new build mm -hmm. which was quite a major step because having a uh, fixing your price then you had to uh, be sure that you're going to be able to deliver. And mm -hmm. in the UK, we had that experience. And what we did have is another cycle of continuous improvement was having engineers at shop floor level in the, in the repair side, identifying technical problems, design problems, feeding back to our designers for the new vehicle builds mm -hmm. and it designing out the uh, these sort of issues and also designing for maintenance. Mm -hmm. So, as we went forward, there was um, designing for maintenance became a key thing, mm -hmm. and that enabled maintenance costs again to reduce, so the contracts that we entered into became very profitable. So, design for maintenance, what does it mean in, term, in practical terms? Access, accessibility to components. Ah, okay, yes, That's of course. Because often, designers look at, because in the most railways in the world, the railways would put a contract out for a new locomotive. Uh -huh. Then the railways would take that back and mm -hmm. maintain it. Mm -hmm. So there was no incentive to design for maintenance. Mm -hmm. The incentive was to design first costs as mm -hmm. cheap as possible to mm -hmm. win the contract. Mm -hmm. So there was a fundamental shift in, in thinking. Mm -hmm. And I was pushing that argument 
to the railways around the world mm -hmm. that there's a real advantage to buy uh, new equipment from companies that understood designing for maintenance is very mm -hmm. important mm -hmm. and designing for maintenance and reliability mm -hmm. and that you will get benefits yeah, which maybe. is what happened because what um, the availability of vehicles pre-privatization of Prowl was around 70% mm -hmm. after uh, about a year or so that figure went up to 92 percent mm. and the eight well, percent were vehicles under maintenance or refurbishment or whatever mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so you had enormous the railways had enormous um improvement in mm -hmm. the use of their assets mm -hmm. they had uh 22 on 70 which is um 30 yeah, percent mm. extra capacity mm -hmm. with that amount of rolling stock amazing and in uk you know the demand increased and increased so without investing in new vehicles the railway operating railways had a lot more vehicles to run trains and carry passengers mm, fantastic. which was a feature of that period uh -huh. so profitability went to the roof i wouldn't say it was we were always subject to competitive tender uh -huh. but there was always um Yes, there's always a strong profitability and, and um, cash flow. Fantastic. Wonderful. Chris, uh, we are in, a, in the middle of a pandemic. Uh, we have a threat, a threat of lockdown again. Many businesses are really anxious and we know that many businesses failed already. And uh, it's a very tense situation. With your experience and wisdom, what would you tell to the entrepreneurs today, to those who are in charge of business, like you were in charge a few years ago? Uh, what would you like to tell them? <laughs> yes, it's a, it's a really dreadful um, period. And um, I, think, I think you've got to face up to the reality of the situation. Mm. And I think you've got to be honest with your workforce and uh, so on. And hopefully the government is providing support where it can. Mm. But I think you've got to look to be ready for the future. Mm -hmm. Because there is going to be a future. Mm -hmm. And I think um, we've all, for those of us that are older, have lived through a lot of ups and downs and uh, mm -hmm. apparent crises and 12% uh, mm -hmm. unemployment in the country. But it comes back. And mm -hmm. the, the key is to plan to how you're going to be even more invigorated and uh, competitive in the future mm. to to be a market leader if you can and uh, and be in demand from your customers so mm. I think and that I think is to means that you've got to employ all the talents of your workforce mm. trust them tell them the truth about what the reality is mm -hmm. and that you know you're doing your best to protect them but you know, there's going to be a future, and mm -hmm. we hope, for not mm -hmm. maybe all companies, mm -hmm. but certainly plan what is the uh, the future and what innovative products mm -hmm. are going to be future's demand. Uh, and and there always is going to be a future, mm. but be keen, slim, and competitive, mm. and have a strong, reactive workforce and use them. Fantastic. Wonderful. You can't afford to lose. Oh, you, yes. don't, you don't afford to lose good people. Yes. 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 Well, I, I, that's, I think that's a, that was an ABB lesson that I learned. Uh -huh. um, because they always encourage people to progress. They always, and people doing a good job, they would look to um, promote them. Uh -huh. But they promoted people without necessarily inflicting fear into them if they couldn't perform mm -hmm. so and sometimes you do over promote mm -hmm. now that's not the individual's fault and uh, and sometimes the company it's the company's fault really in over promoting but then again i think people want to be stretched mm -hmm. but if you get over stretched then accept that as a reality mm -hmm. and abb would always look to take those people and say look i think we'd like you to go to another job where we know you are good mm -hmm. and it would be not 
necessarily in the same location, mm -hmm. but and they wouldn't penalise the guy financially, but they would get the best out of that guy in a job that he was good at mm -hmm. and recognise that that job that he had been promoted to maybe wasn't mm -hmm. his forte. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that generates trust and confidence in the workshop, in the management mm -hmm. and the way they deal with them. Mm -hmm. Fantastic, wonderful. Well, that's so useful for any business in the world, isn't it? If we can recognize it, understand it, fantastic. Mm -hmm. Chris, thanks so much for, oh, sorry, uh, go ahead. One last thing uh -huh, go ahead. is the principle of kiss. A kiss, I like it. Keep it, sim <laughs> yeah. keep it simple, stupid. Yeah. And I think one of the lessons that I learned was when you're internally focused, as we were as a company, we, you're always looking at how can you get the computer system to cover every eventuality and how can you do, you know, some ideal somewhere. Mm -hmm. And this idea that you've got to get 100% isn't necessarily the way what is important for the customer is get improvement immediately mm. and the improvement that you can give by your processes you're better to have 80 percent of a standard system a mm. simple standard system mm. forget about the 20 percent which can be dealt with in another way mm. but get the benefits of that improvement immediately mm. because in two or three years time today the computer systems are out of date anyhow that's right so and i think you have this problem in i think the nhs maybe with uh, they have their own it system they try to do all singing dancing a few years ago cost two billion or more i can't remember and yeah, I remember, they, yeah. oh what a fiasco and uh and it's it's the reality i mean there must have been off the shelf systems that have done 80 percent of that Mm -hmm. and they would have had it in quickly and you would have had the benefits of it mm -hmm. and I think uh, um, I think you know this is something that um, you don't have to be a private company to be able to follow the principles that mm -hmm. I just outlined I mm -hmm. think maybe it can be more difficult if you don't have the threat of com competition mm -hmm. but most people want to improve things if you take, if you have a trust factor and you can generate pride in people in the way they do their job, then people will want to make improvements, I believe. Mm -hmm. um, so, and my experience is that that happens. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, kiss. Front Very back. important. Keep it simple. <laughs> Stupid. <laughs> it's, uh, yes. Yeah, because well, often if you've got a genius at the top of a company mm -hmm. then he can dream up all sorts of fantastic um, uh, innovations, designs and what have you uh -huh. but it's the application yeah. that's key and are you going to sell them and can people follow what you're saying yeah. through a large company yeah. or any size company and the simpler it is the more chance you've got it of it working and I think this, the message also is kiss and apply, um, oh, I don't know, sorry, oh, it's the, uh, yeah, it's the, I'm just trying to think, it's, do, oh yes, sorry, the, the key thing about kiss is also do the simple things well, mm. do them very well, mm. and often even the simple things can be overlooked or bypassed because they think, oh, that's too simple. Mm. And nothing is too simple. Mm. If, it's a, if you can follow a simple, understandable process, then the key is doing it well every time. And I'm afraid you can lose the focus and, and you go adrift. Mm. And so you don't have to have complex systems. Mm. Keep it simple. Do it well. I think Fantastic. that was the other message I think we, we had. <laughs> Fantastic. Excellent. Wonderful. Chris, thank you so much for your time. Mm. Uh, so much wisdom, so much experience being brought in a short interview like that. And I'm sure it will be a great benefit for everyone who listens and wants to learn from you. I learned a lot. Thank you so much. I hope so. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Cheers. <laughs>
Great, fantastic. Well, uh, so much.